Well, it's great to be back. Um, before we get started, are there any questions about anything? Katie has a question. All right. Yes. Um, what would I do if I shared the gospel with someone and they then asked me for tangible evidence of it? The first thing I would ask them to do would be to define tangible. Do they want me to G bring Jesus Christ down from heaven? Do they want, what, what, what exactly do they want from me? Do they want me to take them to the, the British Museum and show them ancient manuscripts? Do they want me to talk about the Qumran discoveries? Do they want me to talk about archaeology or science? You know, what do they mean by tangible evidence? It's just proof. Yes, exactly. But proof comes in all sorts of forms, doesn't it? Um, there's historical proof, right? There's scientific proof. There's mathematical proof. It's what we call philosophical proof, logical. Um, one of the things that, um, that I encourage people to do is, um, here's what I will tell you, that if you want to talk about the validity of Scripture, we can talk about that, about whether it has remained uh, the same throughout the ages. We can talk about the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled and I can show you different archaeological discoveries where the scriptures did not change to fit those prophecies. Um, I can talk to you about my own life and the changes and countless changes and countless other individuals through history. I can talk about what reason would the apostles uh, have to lie? Why would they pr proclaim a lie when most of them, by doing so, died in poverty and died as martyrs? I could go to so many different things, but I am very rare to go to those things. Why? One time I was at a university with a very, uh, very, very intelligent man, and we were speaking to, to people, some unbelievers in the university, and one of them stood up and kind of snidely remarked, well, how do you know the Bible's the Word of God? And I really expected my friend to really unload on him because, I mean, he could do it. He could, uh, he could really do it. He was a brilliant man. And he, go, he just said this. He goes, why or how do I know the Bible's the word of God? He said, well, that's easy because I've read it. Now, at first there was snickering until he explained himself. There are things that are self-attesting. How do I know a mountain's a mountain? How do I know a man's a man? There are things that are self-attesting. When you begin to read the scriptures and as you read them, you do not find more weakness. You find greater marvel. Um, I've been writing a book. I've, I've written, I, I write books. That's what I do. But I, um, I've been working on one book that no one's hardly seen for about 25 years of research on the gospel. It's, probably, I don't know, two or 3,000 pages. And I remember a couple years ago, right after my heart attack, I was doing a thing on Hebrews 10. And I chose Hebrews 10 um, because it kind of consolidates all the book of Hebrews. It kind of brings in what's already been said and it, you know, the, the stuff that follows looks back to it. It's a very important chapter. And I kept running out of my office and telling the guys that I work with, guys, this is, I mean, no one could have done this. There's no mind, there's no human brilliance. No one could have done this. I mean, he is tying things in from, from you know, thousands of years before and all these different things and the brilliance of it. I said, no one could have written this book. And so what I do to a person like that is I tell them, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible and keep reading the Bible. And another thing that you want to be very, very careful of, let, let's say that you come to me one day and you say, um, you know, and I heard a preacher say this one time and it was so wise. He said, um, well, I'll put myself in, in his shoes, okay, so it's, it's a little bit easier to understand. Let's say that 
uh, you come to me and say, you know, Brother Paul, I have witnessed to my father like a hundred times and he still doesn't believe. What can I do? Okay. Well, imagine this. Imagine that you witnessed to your father a hundred times saying this, Jesus, talking about Jesus came, Jesus lived a perfect life, he died, and he rose again from the dead and went to heaven. You share that with him a hundred different times, that story, and he doesn't believe. And then one day you say, again, Dad, listen, Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, he died on the cross for your sins, he rose again from the dead, he was seen by over 500 witnesses, and he ascended into heaven. Do you really think your father's going to grab you and go, what was that one part? He was seen by what? He was seen by 500 witnesses. Why didn't you tell me that the first time? If you'd have told me that the first time, I would have believed. You see, we always think if we only can figure out one more thing to say, that it's going to affect their conversion. And that's not really true. With people like that, what I keep doing is keep sharing the same message and keep loving them and keep praying for them because it is ultimately a supernatural work of God. It is not something extra than the gospel, but the very simple gospel that's going to save them. And, and one of the greatest validations, not the greatest, but one of the greatest validations is my perseverance in loving them. You see. And so even though I can, now I'm not a great apologist like James White or somebody like that, but, but I can argue, but it's, it's not what really the Lord has called me to do. I really believe in the power of this message and I believe in the power of a godly life. And if I can live that godly life in front of them, you know, I remember th that's why I loved being a college student and sometimes, you know, wish I could go back and be a college student again if, if I just didn't have to take classes. Um, but just how I could be a witness. I remember when I was first converted, I was really into weightlifting and my hair was like, you know, about this long. I had a beard and, you know, back then wore army pants, you know, because everybody hippied out kind of that way and everything, you know. And I would go into a gym and tie myself to a deadlifting bar and be hauling up a bunch of weight. And guys would come around, you know, all wanting to talk to me and they'd be like all cussing and acting bad. And, and I'd put the weight down and I'd say, Please don't use that kind of language because, uh, it, you know, you use the name of Christ in a way that really hurts me because I, I really trust in him. And they just can't put two and two together. Our students walking up to you and going, why are you so joyful? And, and tell them, oh, forget it. You wouldn't believe me if I told you and just walk away. And then they're really curious. You see, you have an opportunity. You don't have to be an apologist. Know the gospel that saved you. Keep sharing that message. Keep using scripture and not your fancy arguments. And then, then, then love, shine. That's remember what I'm always telling you guys, my goal for you, you know, is that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Man, you walk around campus like that. Somebody sooner or later is going to, you know, ask you what's going on. And then you share with them. And, and here's the thing, guys, this work is supernatural. It really is. And so you pray for that person. You know, I, 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 don't, know if, I don't know if I'm the one who originated this, but one day I was just thinking about a person that I just couldn't talk to. You know, they just wouldn't listen. And it popped into my head. When I can't talk to God about somebody, then I'm going to talk to God about that somebody. You see, if they won't let me tell them about God, then I'll tell God about them. And that's that Colossians 4, pray for an open door. And, and also another thing, um, know how to, to throw seed and then let it lie for a while. Okay? Is, is, you know, you, you, you plant that seed. And let's say they reject it a bit. Keep being their friend. Keep loving them. Keep, you know, just being that person who serves them. And, and, and that seed will germinate. They'll, they'll come back again and they'll say, what, what, you know, what is this? You know, what is it about you? But guys, the main thing 
is they're going to look for contradictions in your life, okay? And we all know we need to avoid those, not only for them, not only for our sake, but for the glory of God. They're going to look for contradictions. And sometimes they're going to find some, okay? They're going to find some. And what do you do when they do? Ask them to forgive you. Don't hide it. Don't explain it away. I remember one time I was working as a waiter in this, in this place. It was on campus, but it was, these students had this kind of private um, dorm where it was all the, I guess, the, the rich girls, all, a lot of, everybody there was wealthy at least, and they would hire a lot of times Christians to be the waiters. And um, there was a dishwasher in the back, and he was like a golden gloves guy. And I had been a Christian for about a year, and I mean, it was Jesus was everything. I tell everybody about Jesus. And he would just push me and push me and push me and push me. And one day, I'll never forget, I was carrying a big thing of glasses, and he just, I don't know what he said to me, but he made me so mad. And, and I reverted back to the old life. I contradicted my testimony, and I just set that thing down, and I said, come on, right here. I don't care if you're golden gloves. I don't care, because he was. I said, come on, so I'm tired of it. You want me? Here I am. Let's go for it. And I saw the shock on his face when I said that. And then I, I, I just walked away. And I came back because I was eaten up like it was acid inside me because I had contradicted my testimony. And I said, I walked up to him and he kind of went like that. And I said, look, I said, you know I'm a Christian. And I said, I failed. I sinned against you. And I please forgive me. Now notice, I didn't say, I sinned against you because you pushed me. Doesn't matter what he did. I said, but I sinned against you and I, I'm really sorry. I said, would you please forgive me? You know what he did? He goes, man, I, I, uh, I pushed you to it. And that day, even though I had failed, he and I developed a relationship. And I could tell, he, never, he didn't mess with me anymore. There was a respect because what? Even though I failed, brokenness, no excuse, asking for forgiveness, okay? It won his respect. And so as a college student, you're going to fail sometimes, man. You're just going to blow it. And you have to say, I did it. And, and don't, don't give any excuse. that You have not, you literally have not confessed your sin or been broken when you throw up an excuse. Do you see that? Just take it. Even if the person gloats over you, just repent. Because what you're worried about right now is your soul and your testimony. Okay? And so, guys, I, I don't want to sound like it is the message. It's the message that saved. We, we talked about that in Radford uh, this week. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. You don't have to be a great arguer. What you have to be is someone who knows the simple gospel, keeps saying it, prays, and that life, man, that life is what you want to live, okay? And let me say this also, if you're like really zealous for the Lord, and I was, I mean, I was crazy zealous, but in my crazy zealousness, I also made mistakes, okay? I did things that were just really stupid. For example, you know, you're not called upon to be the... Uh, the morality, uh, I don't know, uh, on the morality watchdog or, or something. You know, when you're talking to an unbelieving person, you know, like I've seen these street preachers, you know, that uh, a, a someone will walk by, a girl will walk by and she's not dressed properly and they'll talk about her clothing or a guy will walk by all tatted up and they'll talk about his tats or they'll do this. What, what are you doing? Because a person who walk by you that, that has gone to church all their life and are just, you know, as clean as a whistle, but they're not really a Christian and, and they're no better off than the other one. Don't, don't, don't worry about all that stuff. What you want to deal with is the gospel. Is the gospel. And never forget this when you're preaching. Okay, so a lot of times I have to preach to churches and sometimes, you know, you you got you to gotta speak in a way that is is prophetic that is really speaking about the sins that are going on in american evangelicalism 
And sometimes you have to be hard. But when I'm out there preaching on the streets or talking to people about Jesus, I never forget this is good news. And good news is explained with, with some measure of joy. Do, do you see that? This is good. This is good. You see. And I didn't mean to get off on this totally, but also, you know, pray for discernment. Because there are some people that you, the, when you start talking to them, you will notice, I need, to, I need to get to Romans 3, and I really need to talk about sin. Now, you always need to talk about sin when you're preaching the gospel, because without talking about that, it's, the cross is nonsensical. But here's what I want you to see. Some people are also just broken to pieces. Yes, they're sinners, but they're broken to pieces. They feel like no one in the world loves them, that no one cares about them, that, that they really do feel like they're the dirt under everybody's feet. Now that in itself can be sin, but what I want you to see is I want you to be sensitive. There'll be times when I have to walk up to someone and go, you know what the Bible says? All our good works are like filthy rags. And that we are under the judgment of God because of our sin. There will be times when I'm witnessing that I have to say that to somebody. But there may be another time when I see a person who is just destitute. And I say something like this. You know, you were made for so much more than this. Maybe they're sitting there and they're drunk. Or they're high. Or they've committed some gross immorality. Or they're... They're just, just basically selling themselves on the sidewalk. And to walk up to them and say, you know what? You are made in the image of God. This is not what life is supposed to be. Do you see how? Now, yes, we will get to talk about sin. But do you see how you need to be sensitive to the need? You know, a smoking flax he will not throw out. A bruised reed he'll not break. And yet he will talk about sin. Now, how can you develop that kind of sensitivity and that kind of wisdom? There's, there's no short way to do that. It's not just, oh God, give me the gift of discernment. What it is, is the amount of time you spend in Scripture. As you spend time in Scripture, what's happening? You're renewing your mind. Another way to put it is you're cultivating the mind of Christ. You know, the what would Jesus do bracelet? I don't don't do that. I mean, that's not going to help. The carnal means are not going to help you. It's not a bracelet that's to remind you. It's the word of God that you're meditating on that is to remind you. Because even if this bracelet tells you, you know, reminds you, what would Jesus do? You won't have a clue. <laughs> The only thing you'll be able to answer is, I don't know. <laughs> but if you're renewing your mind in the Word of God, I'll tell you a group that when I was, I don't, I, I don't know much about them anymore, but when I was a young guy in college, you know, the Navigator guys, I don't know if they're even still around, but they would just, Scripture, 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 meditating on Scripture, meditating on Scripture, and it helped me so much. Um, I wasn't in Navigators, but... I, I kind of knew some of the guys and just their emphasis on meditating on Scripture, memorizing Scripture. You see? Another question? That was a good question. Any other question? Come on. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Um, I, I was talking with someone <clears throat> this week about the passage in Matthew. I think it's Matthew 10 where Jesus is sending his disciples out to do ministry. Uh-huh. And... Um, it's 10:16. He says, "Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves." Uh -huh. And I guess it's kind of a question that piggybacks off of what you were just sharing about evangelism. Um, what do you think it means to be wise as serpents? Does that mean there's times when you shouldn't <coughs> share the gospel because mm -hmm. of Reasons or mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I guess what? How do you interpret? Yeah. That? Well, uh, first of all, you know, he mentions a serpent, and we go back into Genesis three, and the serpent was that word there, crafty. He was shrewd, 
And the Hebrew idea of that is it can be a positive thing or a negative thing, okay? Uh, shrewdness can be used in a good way. It can be used in a, in a negative, sinful way. Okay, so we know that he's not saying, you know, because he already says, you know, be as innocent as what? Doves and be shrewd as a serpent. Now, remember, I, I taught the, the group in Radford this week about the law of non-contradiction. Jesus is not contradicting himself. So whatever that shrewdness is, it doesn't violate innocence. But it is, and it's something that, you, you know, here, here's what people do. That they get into a moment and they go, oh, give me the wisdom I need in this very moment. And, and God can do that, the book of James. But, but basically the problem is that's not the way God works, typically. It's no, you spend your life studying wisdom in the scriptures. And then that wisdom is more readily available to you when you're in those situations where you need specific wisdom. So the whole idea here is being wise. Now, if you remember in the, ser if in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, Jesus talks about casting your pearls before swine, given what's holy to the dogs. And, and there are times when, when yeah, I, I've, I've done this. I'll, I'll be trying to share the gospel and the reaction of the person if I go forward one more step, it, it's not going to be helpful. It's just going to be scandalous. You know, I, I did that when I was younger. I remember uh, these, these two people, and they were really doing some vile things in public. And I went over to them to share the gospel with them. I mean, they ripped into me and caused a scandal. And a wiser believer said, Paul, this is one of those situations where you just you let zeal overcome wisdom. Okay? And, and, and that's the case. But let me give it to you on a less, less dramatic thing. I was sitting on an airplane one day and talking to this guy, you know, developing just a conversation with him, and it was really pleasant. And kind of a door wasn't opening for sharing the gospel. So when I get to the point, well, the plane's, you know, we've got another hour, um, I may say something like this. Has there ever been a time when someone shared the gospel with you? Or may I, I'm a Christian, may I share my faith with you? And that's what I did. And it was amazing. The moment I said that, his face just turned. I mean, anger. Up until then, we'd had a wonderful conversation. And I mean, anger. And he was so rude. He said, I don't want to hear anything about your faith, your religion, or anything. And there was a moment of silence. And then I said, uh, so tell me again. I, I forget what it was, but let's say, so tell me again, what, you know, um, um, how, how good is your son at basketball? And you were telling me about, and I just kept the conversation. And I'll never forget, uh, uh, he was actually seated here, and he got up first when the plane stopped, and he got his bag, and I was undoing my, my belt, and about ready to get up, and he got his bag to walk, and he took one step, and he looked back at me, and he goes, hey. I said, yeah. He goes, I am, I am so sorry. I was so rude to you, and you were, you didn't even take offense at it. I, I just want you to know I'm sorry. Now, if when I asked him, can I share my faith with you, and he came really angry, if I'd have just kept coming, what would he have done? He'd probably got off the plane, had a, had a delay or layover, probably gone to the bar with all his friends and talked about how he, how he was accosted by some zealot evangelical. But instead, what happened, the Lord smote his heart. That, that was wisdom, and it must have come from the Lord, not from me, but it was wisdom to restrain at that moment. And, and that's kind of what it's talking about. But also, he's talking to these people, these, these disciples, about going out into the world to be missionaries. Very dangerous. Very, very, very dangerous. And he's saying, Being, be shrewd. Know when to keep your mouth shut. You see. Know when you should speak. Know when you shouldn't. And this is very apropos. I know a group of, um, of students working in a Muslim context. And uh, when I went there to visit them, they were uh, Christians and uh, really reaching out. 
but I was amazed. I think it, I felt like I was almost in a first century kind of setting because when I would, they were bold, but they were so wise and careful and they waited for opportunities and they prayed and they would consult together. They were being innocent as doves, but they were also being wise. Now, this applies especially if you become a Christian on campus or if you get fired up on campus for the Lord and go home and you've decided your parents aren't as fired up as you. And the church that they go to isn't as good as it ought to be. And you come back with all your zeal and, and, and that's just wrong. All right. If you want to impress your parents with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then go back and honor them more. Submit to them more, be more obedient to them, love them more. And they're going to start wondering, you know, what's happened to my child? You see, tell them about your faith. But man, don't don't, you know, be very careful how you go back, because we all know that, don't we? There are students that do that. They'll get fired up, you know, on campus and come to know Christ. Or maybe they're they've just their life has been renewed and they go back and they're little legalists. And they really hurt their relationship with their parents. So you need to be very, very careful. Okay, another question. If not, we'll go to our... Just anybody. This is fine. Okay. I don't want to spend all night on this, but one thing I've been, um, I've been learning about the, the, the new birth, and um, I think theologians take a different view on this. Some think when you're born again, um, you're a new man, but you also have the old man too. And some think you are, you're born again, the old man is dead, <clears throat> you are the new man, and you still have this old like garment of sinful flesh that you live in. Do you, do you think, do you take the view that you are a new man and you have the old, um, the yeah. old nature yeah. as well? Or do you think you are one new man, you know, still with this? Other this man. Tendency? Well, you know, uh, sometimes I hear people talk about, you know, there's two people inside of me, you know, or there's two two natures inside of me. Uh, no, um, only Jesus Christ had two natures in him. Human nature and a divine nature. Okay. Now, when we're converted, this is what I strongly believe and other theologians believe, many theologians believe, that I am a new creature. I am a new man. And that new man is the dominant man. That, that's who I am. It's, not, dominant man is not the good way to say it. It's who I am now, ontologically. I am a new creature. I am a child of God. A better way to say it, that's my reality. That's my identity. That's who I am. Okay? And yet, in this new man, this new creature, there is something called the flesh. And there are many simplistic definitions of what that is, and, and they are simplistic. And, and I, I think that to be very cautious, I say it this way. There is a residue. There is a remnant of the old man, whatever that is, that the fallenness of that old man still in me. But that's not my identity. My identity is a new creature a child of God, new affections, new desires, and yet at the same time, they battle with this remnant of my old humanity, the remnant of Adam. Okay? But Adam is not who I am. I am not two persons battling it out. I am a new creature. That's my identity. Um, I've heard, I remember one time I heard of a very godly a godly man praying this way. He said, oh, Lord, you know, I'm just a I'm just a wretched old sinner with an evil, heart, evil, God hating son, a sin loving heart. And after he got through praying, I said, can I ask you a question? Exactly what happened to you when you were born again? How did you change now? He wasn't that. He really wasn't. He was a man who showed all the evidences of conversion. An, an earnest man, an honest man. But he was using really bad language, you see, to describe his reality. As a matter of fact, he was describing it in, in an erroneous fashion. 
Okay? The fact is, he did not have a sin-loving heart. He loved Jesus, and it was evident in the way he treated his wife, his family, the church, and everything else. But he was trying to get his mind around this battle that still exists in all of us. And that is with this remnant of fallen humanity. But I want you to look at it this way. If I identify myself with that old man, then when sin comes along and sin says, and I'm personifying sin, but sin and the devil comes by and says, you know, here I am. You want me. You want me. You know you're going to love this. And if I see myself in, in the character of that old man, I'm going to go, well, he's right. He's right. That's who I am. I'm a sin-loving sinner. He's right. But if I identify myself with the new man, which is, I think, theologically correct, that's my identity, then I go, no, that's a lie. Now, there's part of me that wants to believe you. And there's part of me that's even drawn to what you're saying. But I know who I am. And I know I can't eat that slop anymore. And if I do take a bite of it because, because I give in or because I'm deceived, I know I'm going to regret it. Because in the same way that a man can't eat pig slop, I can't eat that anymore. Do you see? I want you to really see that. That's why it's so important. My identity. Because the devil's going to tell you, you know, hey, this is what you want. This is who you are. And I go, no, that's not what I want, and that's not who I am. Well, you've fallen into it before. Yes, I have, and I've paid for it dearly because that's not who I am. Do you see? And I stand in that. I stand in the truth of Scripture. I'm a new creature. And any relationship I have with sin is going to be to my detriment and my disgust and my harm. Okay? Very important question. Very important. Another question. Is there any other question? These have been very good. And, and things that you really need to know. Is there anything else you really need to know? Well, if you think of something next week, I'd be more than happy to... Yes, ma'am. Okay, the question is, is it possible to be alive for God, just the same zeal all, all the time? Well, first of all, let's, let's make sure that we understand. And I know you I know, you know this, but I want to make sure that, that it's very clear. God is the one that made us alive. Okay, that's what, the, that's what it means to be born again. That's also called the doctrine of regeneration, to regenerate, to make alive. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, and God made us alive. So we are alive and spiritually alive. You see, before, it's as though we had a heart of stone to God. Not alive, and yet alive to all the wicked stimuli in the world. But the, when we become a Christian, we become alive to God. And we're always that way, because He's the one who made us alive. Now. If we talk about life with regard to zeal, no. Now, we want, as, as we grow toward maturity, through reading the Word of God, through prayer, and through fellowship with the godly saints in the local church, as we, um, as we grow, we should become more stable, more constant, okay? But there will always be... Um, lulls in our life and dangers of lulls in our life, okay? Now, let's say I have five dollars in my pocket. I really do, okay? Uh, or let's say I really do, I really don't. But <laughs> if, if, let's say I really do have five dollars. Those five dollars are there if I feel like it, and they're, they're there if I don't feel like it. They're there if I forget about them, and they're there if I remember them. It is a reality. So I am a Christian. I am alive, regardless of how I feel. 
Also, zeal and feelings often go hand in hand, but don't be deceived by feelings because sometimes a greater degree of zeal is shown when you feel as though your heart is dull. Now you say, how can that be? You know, there have been times listening to a sermon or being in private prayer or going to some meetings or something when I have been filled with such zeal, you know, you go out in the parking lot, you decide I got to go out to the park and witness. I got to do all this. I'm just so fired up right now. Can't sleep. You go home and you pray. And, and, and that's all wonderful. Um, but there are also times when you just feel dead. You feel dead. And there, there's almost just Maybe you're just tired. Maybe you're just wore out. Maybe you haven't spent enough time in the Word. Maybe you're going through a terrible trial that makes you... There's no sense of the reality of God. You say, in that position, how can I ever glorify God? In that position, you may glorify God more than you ever have in your life because you're standing there. Think about it. When you're on the mountaintop and you're full of all these feelings and you're going on, pressing on to know the Lord, well, that's, that's pretty explainable. Remember what Satan said about Job? Yeah, he follows you. He believes in you because you blessed him. Take everything away. Have it appear as though you've totally abandoned him. Even set yourself against him and let's see what Job does. But Job remained believing, right? He wasn't perfect and he wasn't without complaint, but he held on. I know my Redeemer lives. My body screaming with pain. I have no sense of His presence, but I know He lives. And I know He's with me. How do you know? Because He spoke it. He said it. And so what are you doing? In that moment, I submit to you, you're glorifying God and demonstrating more genuine zeal than in those mountaintop experiences because you're believing His Word. When you believe His Word, Never, never forget this. When you believe His Word, you believe His character. You see that? You're believing in His character. There's nothing you can do more to exalt a person than believe in their character. You're believing in His name. Do you see? And, um, and, and that's very, very important. Very important. And uh, let me... Um, I don't know if we have time because I'd like to get, get to something else, but look, look for a moment at Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. Very unusual text that we have in Isaiah 50. Look what it says in verse 10. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Wow, look at that. We're talking about someone who does what? Who fears the Lord, obeys the Lord, and yet he's walking in darkness and has no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. So he has no sense of anything, what we would call no, no experience, no sensual, not sensual, but no sensibility in the sense of confirmation that God is with him. He looks around him and everything, it seems like God has abandoned him. There's no, as people say, the sense of God's presence. There's no encouragement. There's nothing. And yet look what this guy does. He trusts in the name of his Lord and relies on his God. At that moment, he's glorifying God more than anybody on any mountaintop experience. Because he's trusting in the name of his God. Now, look at verse 11. Behold, all of you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands, Walk in the light of your fire and among the brands you have set ablaze. This you will have from my hand. You will lie down in torment. Now, there's a general application here with this text, I believe. Have you met? I have met so many people that have identified themselves with the Christian faith that they cannot be content with the Word of God. They must feel something. 
there, there must be some sort of spectacular something going on around them. So they make a false fire. They do something to get themselves psyched up, you know, go to some wild praise concert or get in with a bunch of people who are going to start, you know, I mean, you just kind of a mob mentality, you just get carried away by religious ecstasy and everything else, and then they feel good about their faith. That is not relying on the name of your God. I bless the times when I've had uh, experiences that were very emotional, very affirming, very pleasant, uh, very encouraging with the Lord in prayer or in a church service or, or just in some personal moment, you know. And, and I, I praise God for those times when I feel like I'm just picked up with zeal and, and the, the Spirit of God is just seems to be just carrying me along. I, I, but those times when I literally thought, there's no, I mean, I, I feel nothing. And even my heart itself is dead. I have such little zeal. But the God who began a good work in me is going to finish it. You see? I've met believers who are very prone to melancholy. It's kind of an old term, but you guys would say depression. And you say, well, how does such a person glorify God? They glorify God when in the midst of that melancholy, they hold on. They hold on. You see. Is there another question? Yes. Satan wants us just as much as God does. It's like there's a tug of war, but obviously God's going to win. And like we just got to, from my personal experience over the past year, I've, I've gotten, you know, there's been times where I've been questioning God. Like, well, what are you doing? You know, what, what is your plan? Mm-hmm. You know? And, you know, you got to work on his time. You know, it's all about his time, and he's going he's gonna to get it done in his time. And, like, I'm starting to see things come together. Mm-hmm. You know, he, Job at times himself, you know, was kind of like, you know, what are you doing? Here? And God showed him all the beauty in the world and everything, and then he gave him everything back. Yeah. So it's all about, I think patience is the biggest thing. Well, James talks about the patience yeah. of Job and, and those who have suffered, the prophets. And know this, this is very, very important. What is, I don't want to say the most precious commodity in your life to God. I mean, I need to be very careful with a statement like that, but what is he really shooting for? You say, well, conformity to Christ, yes, absolutely. But there's something, you know, he talks about the preciousness of our faith, of testing our faith. You know, and, and why is that so important? Faith is believing when you do not see, when you do not feel. So what's really going on there? Faith is a declaration of your confidence in the character of God. 
And I think maybe if, if there's one thing Satan hates more than anything else is, is that, that when we have no, you know, when, when everything is screaming at us to the contrary, we trust. We don't have anything to look at, anything to touch. We trust in what? The character of God. In the Word of God, we cling to Him, His character. And, and, and that is so very, very important. And, and all the trials in your life, and you are going... I, I was sharing with someone today, we were talking about the things we'd gone through, but also the things that our friends have gone through. Terrible, terrible trials. And I said something that I had heard a long time ago. I said to... to uh, to one of my pastors, I said, you know, extraordinary people go through extraordinary things. Now, it doesn't mean famous people. It's not what I'm talking about or tremendously gifted people. I mean, if, if you, the most extraordinary thing is to be conformed to the image of Christ. And if you desire to be extraordinary in your conformity to Christ, you're going to pass through extraordinary things. A man by the name of Jowett wrote a book, The School of Calvary, and basically the gist of it is there's no way to conformity to Christ apart from suffering. And to the degree that you want to be used of Christ, you will suffer. But it's all for our good. Our good. Okay, we can do one more short question and then, well, we'll take our text next week. Okay. <laughs> I've been, uh, excuse me, I've been reading through Genesis. Uh huh. Past the Noah and the flood story not that long ago. Yes. And, like, I guess when you read, like, God's language, you can kind of come away with, like, an idea that, like, maybe he regretted flooding the earth. Uh huh. I think that doesn't make too much sense, so I just want to know your perspective on that. No. God, there's a, there's a big debate about whether God has passion or not. Now, passion means a sense of feeling or a sense of, well, we would say emotion, things like that. But the, the, the thing that we need to see is that God is not this. He's not a concrete block. Um, he loves. You can grieve the spirit. I mean, so many different things. But what we need to understand is God is not controlled by passion. He's not controlled by emotion or feeling. They do not manipulate him. They do not control him. Uh, they are, they are in, in my opinion, they are, they are subject to his immutable will and his decrees. He's not like us, carried around by so many, many things. Um, God made the creation and it was good. For him to say he grieves or regrets the destruction of his creation does not in any way give evidence that he feels like he made a mistake in doing so. You see, it's a mere fact that this is his. Everything he does is an expression of his love. And to bring that to an end because of the sin of man. It, it's like I said, he's not a concrete block who just says, well, I, I got rid of that one. I'll go build another one. And, and there's oftentimes when he'll say things like that. Remember to Jonah. He said, you know, Jonah's wanting the Ninevites to be destroyed. He doesn't want them to repent. And God says, I have thousands of people in this city and livestock. Did you ever catch that? I got animals in there. Now think about that. He cares about that. And so to wipe that clean, it was, it was something of grievous. And, uh, you know, it's very important that you know, God loves. God talks about, again, grieving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And yet, know this, He is immutable. He is not subject to passions as we are. He is perfect. Everything is balanced. It's a very big question. Very difficult answer. Um, All I can tell you to close is those were good questions. And I say that wanting you to know that not all questions are good questions. 
<laughs> but those were good questions. Another thing is that whenever I talk to anybody, the older I get about the Lord, the more I feel like I owe them an apology. And I always walk away with a bit of melancholy. He is so wonderful. And oh, how he has had to carry me through my life, especially in these last years. He is so utterly amazing. This is not some upstart. I mean, I've been this is 35 years or more. And, and I, I almost weep when I try to tell you how good he is because I just hate myself in the sense that I'm going to fail in trying to even... See, I can't even comprehend how good he is or how good he's been to me. And what I do comprehend, I can't even explain. But that's a wonderful thought, isn't it, for you? You see, you think that, oh, when you're young, you know, there were so many things when I was young that everything was bigger than life. I remember playing in our high school basketball gym. Well, when I played there, I thought it was Madison Square Gardens. I mean, it, you know, and then a friend of mine rebuilt the gym. Uh, and he, I went and visited back there several months ago. And it was like, can you even throw a basketball in this place? I mean, it was so small. It was unbelievable, you know. And so you're always afraid. You know, when I get older, is God going to get smaller? Is it going to get not as good? Am I going to see through this as it wasn't even close to what I thought it was? No. You, it, it's just so big. And He's so good. And He's so faithful. That it's absolutely amazing. You know, when, um, you know when, when Peter's out there fishing, Jesus says, throw the net over, and he pulls in all the fish, and then Peter falls down in the boat and says, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Remember that? You know, but what's really going on there? When you get older, maybe you understand it now. Maybe you understand it better than I do. Uh, I'm a slow learner. But it, it's... He's going to show you so much good, even in pain. He's going to show you so much good that you're going to have a tendency to want to go, Lord, this is wrong. You shouldn't be this kind to someone like me. It, it just almost feels wrong. That's how good he is. That's how good he is. And he's not, he's not going to get... The, the further up you go and the further in you go, the bigger it gets. Not the smaller. The bigger. And that is a very encouraging thought. You have got so much. If you belong to Him, you've got so much ahead of you. So, so do, as the Scriptures say, press on to know the Lord. And whatever lies behind you, Leave it behind you. Just leave it there. And just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. When I finished with this story, whenever I would go through the jungle with the, with the, the Peruvian indigenous peoples, or especially the mountains, the high Andes mountains, I mean, these Peruvians, just amazing. Their, their physique, you know, just being able... <laughs> You know, you're at 10,000 feet and they're just flying up the mountain. And I'm just going, keep breathing, keep breathing. <laughs> one step more, one step more. I remember one time, I was like 32 and all buff and had my really cool backpack and everything. And I'm like struggling to make it up this mountain. I hear a noise behind me. It's a little 60-year-old Peruvian man with, with yankees on. Yankees are sandals made out of truck tires. He's got like a 50, 60 pound bag of grain and he just runs right past me and looks at me. <laughs> and I'm just going, keep breathing, keep breathing. <laughs> you see, but, but here's what I want you to see. In, in the mountains, the people will say this. If you see a brother in the mountains, you go, ¿Cómo está, hermano? Avanzando, hermano, avanzando. Advancing, brother, advancing. That's what they, I always got so much kick out of that. How are you doing? Advancing advancing 
So not lamenting, oh, I went back here. Not lamenting, got so far to go. It's just every day, what is it? Avanzando, hermano, avanzando. I'm advancing, brother, I'm advancing. One foot in front of the other, keep breathing. Because he's good. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your kindness. Thank you for the beauty you've created in these students. And, oh, Lord, that they would go from glory to glory. Lord, I know they will go through dark, dark times. Please, Lord. Well, I don't even need to ask. You will be faithful to them. You will never press them beyond what they can bear. Your grace will be sufficient. Lord, carry them all home to glory. In Jesus' name, amen.